rum pots. They're used to curious sights, which they attribute to alcoholic delusions. Whoever. This is how we did that. Bet you didn't know. Welcome, Ice Warriors, Englishmen, and cameoing Falli, to the 211th episode of an Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 14th of June, 2017, and featuring two of the, no, Curse of the, wait, it's Empress of Mars, written by Mark Gaddis, and starring Peter Capaldi as the Doctor, Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts, and Matt Lucas as Nardole. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and I am now an owner of the dubious knowledge that there are two plurals of phallus. With me are Mad Matt Winchell. I had sushi and I'm having ramen. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Thanks for sharing, Bill. Seriously, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. My sunburn is peeling. Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. The Atlantic Ocean sure has a lot of water. And Thomas Fireheart Kennedy. I'm expecting to have to mute my mic a lot because I've got a really bluffed up nose. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Atlantic there, Ocean, done that. The, the Atlantic Ocean has a baby amount of water compared to the Pacific. <laughs> Actually, that oh. may or may not be true. I can't remember which one has the freaking huge trench. Mariana's Trench, I'm you mean? pretty sure yeah. that's in the Pacific. All right, then you're probably right. Ah, hmm. uh, Ramana. Well, I didn't say it had all the water. I said it had a lot of it. I, well, the thing is, I can never remember which one has the Mariana's Trench. I, I, I usually say that frickin' huge trench because if I don't watch myself, I will call it the Marinara Trench. <laughs> and now I'm hungry. Yummy, that's a spicy meatball. Yeah, exactly. What wasn't that the trench Pacific Rim was named for? It's quite possible. Um the reason I've always called it that, I think, is because it was like called that once on an old episode of DuckTales and it just stuck in my head. <laughs> called like it the that. big ass trench in DuckTales? No, the Mar the Marinara Trench. Oh, okay. I was gonna they, say they did wow, something like that, but the fact is, I know mine. if I leave it to my mind, it will get it wrong. So I just always say that big ass trench. Anyway, coming up tonight on the podcast, we have, of course, our news, and we have a little bit of that. Um, I don't think we have anything particular geeky we need to talk about this week. So, following that, we will be going right into our review of Empress of Mars. So if that's what you're interested in, I would suggest tuning in at about the one hour mark. Uh, until then, uh, let's go ahead and start the news, huh? No. Never. <laughs> I let's not and say we did. I refuse. Let's go to the review and screw everything up. Yeah, but then, uh, then no one will stay and listen to the news. And what will I do? Because I've spent all week building this new... Uh, we gotta do it for Randy, man. Gotta do it for Randy. Alright, so, uh, first thing we go to is birthdays. And, of course, we, ha we had a big birthday on the 8th of June this year. Big. Or this week. Well, big, relatively, it's a doctor. Mind you, He's not the... He's also a big doctor. <laughs> Yes, he is. Also not the most well-liked, but he is a doctor nonetheless. Colin Baker turned 74. Colin was only in a couple of short films this way, this year, playing Professor James Friedkin in Last Man on Earth and himself in When I Grow Up. 
This is, of course, on top of his usual big finish work, where he's a lot better than he was on TV. Happy birthday, Colin. Uh, next on the 9th of June, we have the birthday of David Troughton, son of Second Doctor Patrick Troughton, and, of course, King Peladon in the Peladon, seri Peladon uh, episodes. Turn 67. David has been working with the Royal Shakespeare Company in the last year, uh, doing the most recent version of King Lear, and will be in Titus Andronicus this year. Mm. And finally, on the 11th of June, we have Kit Pedler, uh, one of the co-creators of the Cybermen. He would have been 90, but unfortunately died in 1981 at 53. Uh, Kit was either the principal writer or contributor for most of the first and second Doctor Cyberman serials. He was the principal writer for basically first the the la the Tenth Planet and the early Second Doctor stuff, but then contributed to I believe it was Wheel in Space and the Invasion. So, posthumous happy birthday to Kit, happy birthday to David, and once again happy birthday to Colin. Uh, there has been no lost stories this week, so we don't have to pass anybody, of course, other than, of course, Adam West, which we mentioned in our opening bump, mm -hmm. which wasn't really a Doctor Who death, but is a death that affects all of us in one way or another. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty yeah. sure most of us have grown up with Adam West as the Batman. Yeah. One way or the other. He either grew up with him as Batman, we grew up with him as the Grey Ghost in Batman the Animated Series, or the Mayor of Gotham in the Batman, or the Mayor of Quahog. In Family Guy. Either way, he's been there in one way or another, and he will be missed. So, uh, episode news. Aaron. All right. So we've got the overnight viewing figures for Empress of Mars, which brought in an estimated audience of 3.58 million viewers. That's 20.6% uh, of the total TV audience. Um, that is an unofficial uh, overnight viewing figure. So uh, they were down across the day. Uh, nothing really topped over 5 million views. Uh, let me see here. So the top was Football World Cup on ITV with 4.73 million watching. The Voice uh, Kids in uh, The Voice Kids. Ah, uh, okay. Must be either two programs or a spinoff of The Voice. Uh, had 4.23 million. Uh, BBC One, uh, there was the UK election that was kind of messing around with everything. So BBC News uh, apparently garnered about 4.32 million views. <laughs> uh, Casualty had 3.9 million. Uh, Mrs. Brown's Boys, 3.58 million. And uh, Doctor Who was kind of far down at the sixth uh, most viewed. So. Well, so does that mean Britain's Got Talent is done for the year then? Because I believe usually it does. They're, I was going to uh, say, because they're not even mentioned, so they're yeah, only... Last week had the final heats for Britain Got Talent in the finale. So yeah, it's, I looked it's, in, the, uh, done. in the last week ratings, there's a Britain's Got Talent result, so that does sound like mm -hmm. that was the finale. Yeah, it was. That's those were finished. Um, but anytime, anytime you have you have football World Cup on there, it's going to take the top place. I mean, that's yeah. it's the, it's, it's the freaking World Cup. Yeah, yeah. the Show cup of the world. Got... And yeah, I do suspect the election had a lot of people subdued and just watching the news because yeah, that's well... really you just sit there and watch and wait to see what happens. Their par parliament is kind of messed up a little bit now. Yeah, they kind of shut themselves. Their prime ministers kind of shot themselves in the foot right now. Mm -hmm. Chaos. All right, so let's have the press reactions for Empress of Mars. Radio Time thought that it was a very uh, well-made story. Uh, let me see here. The Mirror felt it was a good story with a decent thread. Uh, the Telegraph. Um... The mirror wasn't confused. What? What? <laughs> what, 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 what in the world is this? How's the mirror not confused or pissed? Oh at wait, it? wait, wait, wait! They're they're talking about Cybermen in this. So yeah, it's they're still confused. Um... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, no, I would actually I would actually like to note 
The mirror uh-huh. actually got this right. Mm-hmm. It's it's he. They say at the end of their article, it's almost as if Doctor Who met the Zulu, the film Zulu on Mars. The thing is, in an interview with Mark Gaddis, that was what he was trying to do. He was <laughs> trying to do the Zulu Wars as a science fiction. That's pretty cool, though. Mm. Edutainment. So, but no, I'm just surprised the mirror actually got it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mirror didn't go complete bonkers. Whoever this guy is, he must be new. Keep him. Even a broken clock. <laughs> oh, they'll break <laughs> eventually. The Telegraph thought that the uh, Ice Warriors were pretty much well done. Uh, IGN thought they looked good. Uh, Digital Spy felt the Ice Warriors worked but had doubts about the human element of the story. AV Club felt the episode had interesting ideas, which didn't quite come together. Den of Geek paid tribute to supporting cast. Ars Techna felt the story was a great improvement on the Mox... Mox trilogy? You mean Monks trilogy? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think that meant to be Monks. Uh, and Games <laughs> Radar called the episode stoic and dependable. I thought it was... Yeah. yeah. I will say this... Um, Gaddis, I think, did do a better job uh, writing character backstory than we've gotten for a while. Yeah. Very much so. so. Yeah. All right, so let's go to Australia's Overnights, Aaron. Mm-hmm. All right, let's see here. Yeah, there we go. All right, so we've got the Australian Overnights for Empress of Mars and final ratings for Pyramid. Um, Australia, it was 384,000 views in the five major capital cities. Um, it was the highest rated ABC drama of the day with the 10th highest rating program of the day overall. These ratings do not include iView, regional, or time-shifted viewers. Uh, Pyramid at the End of the World averaged 506,000 uh, consolidated viewers in the five major capital cities with 86,000 extra viewers. Uh, it was the highest, third highest time shifted program of the day. Uh, the highest time shifted program had 177,000 extra viewers, and the eleventh highest rating program of the day overall. So it does look like uh, having some ice warriors has paid off on the ratings a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm. Ice warriors. All right, now we have the appreciation index for Empress of Mars at, is at 83. That's a high. Is, yeah. yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's actually it's actually, it's bumped, high, yeah. it's actually bumped higher than their their the uh last most of the season. Yeah. I think <laughs> we've had one it's one, one other 83 and everything right else has been 82. Mm-hmm. Just about and of course, the highest score was for Casualty, which had an 84. So pretty which good. That's, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, that's actually down for Casualty as well, because Casualty, I think the highest we've ever brought up for Casualty, it was like 87. So this is low for them, I think. It's <laughs> a so down week for them and a high week for Doctor Who. Oh my. Wow. <laughs> Casualty Doctor Who crossover. Make it happen. And it's instantly shot in the foot and cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gone. Alright, so that's it for the appreciation index. Where to now? Um, you have one more article. You slipped that in there bef- after I had opened up everything. Jeez. I, I had put that in bath. there five hours ago. <laughs> what? <laughs> That was there Wait, uh, long enough that I, I got it, all, Aaron. I look for all That's of fine. the red I, I'll, I'll it take was... it from you if you want, because I, I, I read this article and I read the related... All right, uh, watch the related video. It. Okay, so uh, Mark Gaddis made an interview in the after show uh, where he talked about where his ideas came from for creating this episode. Um, this episode actually went through several re-edits over the course of creating it. Originally, he was planning on making a sequel to Sleep No More. Ugh. He wanted to he wanted to do a two-part chain where, you know, he had the same monster featured in two episodes. However, uh, when the Brexit vote happened, 
And basically the world kept changing. His mind kept going back to the Ice Warriors and to Peladon. And what he wanted to make was a third Peladon movie. If you remember, back in 1972 was when Britain first joined the EU, when that vote actually happened. And that's when Peladon was made with their story, which was a light satire about a planet called Peladon joining the Galactic Federation. It was supposed to generally reflect what was going on there. Well, with Brexit happening, Gaddis wanted to basically make a Peladon um, episode where Peladon was, was voting to get out of the Galactic Federation. Basically a satire of Brexit itself. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that didn't go over too well with uh, some of the higher-ups at the BBC, so he was forced to rewrite it into what eventually became Empress of Mars. Mm -hmm. There are some portions of stuff that takes place in there, um, which are kind of leftover, leftover references to that. Right. Uh, one of the things you notice is in one part of the episode, um, the the Empress starts yelling "Sleep no more" when she's waking up her soldiers. That is a direct reference to "Sleep no more." That Gaddis threw into the script as a as, as a shout out. <laughs> It's not going to make us watch it, though. And some of the <laughs> dialogue of the uh, some of the dialogue of the British soldiers, in particular, uh, maintains some of this mentality. Don't belong here. We're British. Mars is part of the Empire now. Is basically kind of one of those little exchanges. The mm, the, the Empress also had uh, at least one Brexity line. Yeah, so those were kind of holdovers that were rewritten for uh, the uh, rewritten for the new uh, for the new writing. But that kind of takes you through Gaddis's mentality when writing this episode. Okay. <laughs> All right. So and now that we brings go us on to uh, my articles. Um, so uh, last week we had Lie of the Land, and uh, it was pummeled in the overnight due to uh, Britain's Got Talent being at the same time, uh, the man, the One Love Manchester Benefit concert being the same day, and other things. So here we have the official ratings, and uh, while the number did go up, you know, significantly, it still uh, barely managed to squeeze into the top thirty. It did end up with 4.82 million viewers, which I believe is about standard this season. Maybe on the low end of standard, but not unbelievably so, like the you know, like the overnights were. Uh, actually, um, I I still think it was uh, listed as being pretty bad. Um, let's see. No, th this is this is some pretty opened. this is pretty low for even Doctor. This Who. is the first time Doctor Who yeah. has dropped below five million viewers since the new the start of the new series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, people were just lost with uh, *Lie of the Land* at this point, and uh, just didn't care about this see. trilogy anymore. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the lowest this season had been *Oxygen* at five point two seven million. So yeah, this is this is, is still a bit still a bit hurt. And again, that's there are probably still quite a few people that you know are more casual fans that if they don't watch it the night of, they just don't watch it. Uh, but uh, t taking the first place was the One Love Manchester Benefit concert uh, with 11.63 million. That was aired on BBC One uh, right before Doctor Who. Um, and then, of course, everybody switched over to ITV One to watch Britain's Got Talent when it was time for Doctor Who to come on. Uh, that was also the Britain's Got Talent finale. Um, there was also Coronation Street, Emmerdale, and EastEnders that night. Uh, mm. And so, for Doctor Who, they're basically saying, I'll wait for the uh, Blu-rays. Oh, sorry. They weren't all that night. They were that... Some of them were just that week. Sorry. But yeah, so... I'll not wait a very for it great to hit Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> Go be waiting a while. Um, <laughs> and considering that this was the third part of a trilogy, that might be a general feeling about how people felt, you know, a general indication of how people felt about the trilogy in general. Which was meh. Yeah. All right. It was overall uh, meh. 
Uh, all right, so that was our past episodes. Now we need to go back to the future uh, with the Eaters of Light, written by Rona Monroe. Uh, had we, I don't think we'd covered the blurb before, right? So I'll go ahead and cover that briefly. A long time ago, the Ninth Legion of the Roman Army vanished into the mists of Scotland. Bill has a theory about what happened, and the Doctor has a time machine. But when they arrive in ancient Aberdeenshire, what they find is a far greater threat than any army. In a carn on a hillside is a doorway leading to the end of the world. And we have photos. Wow, so this is this is going to be us going to the past and then going to the past some more. Yeah, apparently. So this uh, looks. This is the episode uh, that we had been we were wondering about when we saw the season uh, trailer uh, of the people with the uh, unusual makeup. Uh, I forget the... what we had speculated, but based on this, it looks like these are the ancient Scotsmen. Uh, well, I don't know how ancient that. Well, yeah, ancient because it's Rome. It's Roman era. Yeah, this is this but, is Roman era, so this mm. would be early AD, I think. Yeah, pro, uh, most likely. Oh yeah, ninth century. No, no, never mind. Ninth legion, not 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 ninth century. Yeah. Um, this would be like two hundred AD, maybe somewhere like two hundred yeah. BC to two hundred AD, somewhere in there during the yeah. Roman occupation of the British Isles. Right. Um, and I know they technically occupied till like the seventh century, but um, by the fact that they're venturing into Scotland, it probably mm -hmm. sounds like it's more like the four hundreds, maybe. Possibly. I don't see Arthur Darville among the photographs, so he was not part of the Ninth Legion. Yes, would this actually be the same Legion that used to sit around freaking? Um, uh... <laughs> uh, what was suddenly Stand my brain? To... Stonehenge, yes. Unfortunately, but, there are. It doesn't look like there's any photos of the monster of the episode. It looks like they're kind of they're keeping that to the shadows until the actual episode. No Stonehenge, but they do have a circle of big stones standing upright. Well, yeah. I mean, this is they're way north in Scotland now. Stonehenge is on the southern coast of England. Hmm. So, this is up going into Scotland. So basically, the the uh, the Ninth Legion goes into Scotland and discovers a Balrog. <laughs> that is kind of what it sounds like, doesn't it? Well, that's an interesting story. So, uh, when does the Doctor officially state that he's right against the Brown? <laughs> oh God, how fitting is that, consider <laughs> considering who wrote it? Yeah, well, you know, in this version, he'd be more like Doctor the Black, let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, how many shades of black can, Compal can Capaldi use? Well, he's apparently wearing at least three of them right now. <laughs> and that's without the shades. Yes. <laughs> well, the trailer gives us a bit more of a hint at the monster yeah, the, that's the involved. Yeah, the trailer shows more of the monster. Not, you know, it's still kept to the shadows, but you see mm -hmm. proportionately a lot more compared to the photos. Uh, does anybody see anything about the photos that really stands out to them that they want to mention? Nope, um... just some just some wonderful Scottish hills that makes me want to start singing Here We Are, Born to be Kings, We're the Princes of the Universe. <laughs> the Doctor is holding some kind of, it's not a mirror, but it looks like a white stone in between two, um, fort, in, inside a forked branch or something like that, or a looped branch. It, I don't it, think... it looks like yeah. almost like a magnifying glass. Yeah. Except mm. it doesn't look to be transparent. Yeah, it doesn't right. look transparent enough. Costume looks. You challenge really the online. aliens to a game of table tennis. <laughs> well, you give you give the BBC period outfits, and they're like all for that, man. Yeah. Especially well, and, if they're English period costumes. And Different unlike versions of English the girl, uh, unlike the girl who died, this seems to be a little bit more serious and almost like a more Games of Throne ish type. I actually said that when I looked thing. at the costume and the Almost, architecture yeah. in when we saw mm -hmm. stuff in the early trailers, I'm mm -hmm. still getting that vibe. It, it looks they, like Nardole is cosplaying as Arthur Dent for this episode. <laughs> yes, I noticed that. He's in a freaking bathrobe. Yep, and pajama <laughs> pants and slippers. 
Does so he have his wonderful towel? Apparently, uh, the doctor got him out of bed for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only thing he's missing is his wonderful towel, unless he's holding it behind his back. Well, the, the thing about the thing about a bathrobe is that it's a towel that you can wear. No, so but you, even Arthur Dill had a towel on top of his bathrobe. <laughs> True. He does. He he does have the Jane hat though, so that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know that man's not afraid of anything. Even and if he then, looks perplexed at times. And then it looks like we've got uh, some evening shots, some night shots, some cave shots. Some the forest shots, some, some in, the, yeah, in the tunnel. It's just, yeah, th there's not much to Googling on these images at the moment. Yeah, because they're mostly all of the same people, so it's not like yeah. we see anything in particular. Seems to Although, be the same four um, or five scenes. The uh, one uh, at the, uh, what is it? One, two, three, fourth row at the end looks very Lord of the Ringsy. Oh, uh, the white light in the background? Mm hmm. Kinda. I, I see that in my brain starts going, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> All of a sudden, the cohort of elves is going to arrive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but other than that, no, it's just they, they seem to be like, hey, look, it's the doctor, it's the doctor and Bill, it's the doctor and a native. The, the doctor and Bill climb up an ent. Mmm, home, get off me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it really can't tell much of anything that's going on by these pictures, so it's all going to be guesswork. Mm. All right, so our next piece is. Uh... That, uh, yeah, according to Matt Lucas, the finale of Series 10 is going to be Michelle Gomez's turn to have a lot of fun. Hmm. Um, this is supposed to be, as far as we know, unless something, you know, is secret going on with the Christmas special, Michelle Gomez's last appearance as, as the current Missy. Uh, who knows about, you know, future multi-master or Missy appearances. Um... As possibly her last appearance as Miss. If, you, if you're life. wondering, Bill, uh, what he was mm -hmm. talking about is they were they were asking him um, how much of Nardle what is ad libbed by him. Okay. And he said that for these two episodes, he stepped it back to give Missy the chance to shine because it's her moment to have fun. Ah. Okay. Because both apparently both uh, Matt Lucas and Michelle Gomez are the same that way. He says about her, you never know what's going, what she's going to do on this take or that take. And Matt Lucas is the same way. He'll do different stuff uh, in different takes. And just to go see, whatever works. See what, see what gets out of the chat. See mm -hmm. what gets through the edits. Mm -hmm. Like uh, <laughs> in uh, Empress, there's this scene briefly where he uh, uh, puts on the helmet, breathes on the glass, and then wipes the outside of the glass. <laughs> <laughs> And he said he did that on like the third or fourth take, just because he <laughs> wanted to see if it would make it through. Which one would make it through the edits? And sure enough, the editor, the editors took that one. Ah. <laughs> um. And Missy's apparently, or Michelle Gomez is cut from the same cloth. She will do stuff completely different each time, just to see, you know, which goes through. But he said that he really reined it back for the finale, just to let her have a blast at it. So what we can glean by that, by the way, is that it's kind of going to be more of the Missy show in the finales. The mm. Missy Master show. It might even mean that the Cybermen, which were, you know, all taught it and everything, are actually going to be a minor note to Missy and the Master. They're just thrown into the mix to help make Kapir feel special for his big finale for the main season. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Right, our next piece comes from the Radio Times, and apparently they don't have proofreaders because Chris Chibnall's name becomes Chiball at one point. Well, that's better than Chinball. <laughs> I still refer to him as the Balchinian. Uh, if those remember, uh, that was a uh, speaking mistake that was made when we first introduced him as the new Doctor Who, and it's kind of been a running gag by me since then. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, 
Yeah, some quotes from Chibnall here. I'm just trying to pick and up some the quotes right by ones. J- uh, by James Strong, who's basically uh, Chibnall's version of Mark Gaddis. We are probably going to see him um, direct okay. coming up, starting in series eleven, because he's a director, not a writer. But he's a conspirator with uh, Chibnall. Uh, Chibnall does mention that he had resisted accepting the role of Doctor Who showrunner for a very long time, uh, which implies that he was offered the role at least once in the past. Uh, And that he was surprised at how enthusiastic the BBC was uh, about his ideas for the show. He said he had ideas about what he wanted to do with it when he went to them and said, this is what I would do. He expected them to say, ooh, let's talk about that. Instead, they said, great. I think that was more like, ooh, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, Um, They do... uh, It's mentioned that uh, Chip... Chibnall's tone suggests there may be a radical revamp of Doctor Who, uh, which will please those who have suggested the sh- uh, that the show needs a kick up, kick up the tar. Oh, that the show needs to kick up its ass, essentially. Um, yeah, I don't really see anything about what Chibnall's big ideas are, other than that he has ideas. Um, I don't know BBC- if it was from yeah. this article or another one, but he's talking about doing season-long storylines. Which would be interesting. Um, But the big news here is that Strong mentions the fact that this is a five-year project, which means that Chibnall has Ah. signed on for five seasons of Doctor Who. Which, Mm. oddly enough, is the second time we've heard five years of Doctor Who, considering (laughs) what they were signing with the Chinese, I think we reported last week or the week before. Right. So Mm. this does, since we're hearing this from two different locations... This does say that Doctor Who is officially up for five years. Yeah, this does seem to indicate that Mm. the BBC is working on a five-year plan for Doctor Who actively rather than just passively. Mm -hmm. Which is Mm. not normal for a show. No, no. Normally they'll do it a season or two at a time. But they're planning through the 15th season, so... So just like, gauntlets off. Let's do this. Mm Mm-hmm. And Chibnall... And that'll put Chibnall up there with uh, people... I think Moffat was there longer. Let's see, Moffat was there 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, so Moffat's been there eight years. Um, Chibnall's now signed on for five with probably an option to extend. Which means he'll be mm. between Russell and uh, Moffat. Russell was there five, six, seven, eight, nine. He was there five years, so he'll be the same. Yeah. He's at least signed on for the same length as Russell T. Davies. Mm. Whereas, Which, you know, this is good. Arch, because... Whereas Moffat was there for eight years, but that was six seasons. Yeah. And the only person mm. that's ever been running Doctor Who longer than Moffat is, is John Nathan Turner. And less we talk about that, the better. Thank God at least <laughs> Moffat has the sense to let go of the ball. <laughs> Although, to be fair, Nathan Turner apparently was trying to give away the ball, but I guess it was like a hot potato that nobody wanted. Yeah, it was rapidly falling into stuff, and he just made a lot of bad decisions. He, I think he just kept wanting to find it to leave Doctor Who on a good note to pass out, but he just couldn't get that good note back. Which I think is also part of Moffat's problems, considering how the ratings have fallen, yeah, et cetera. All right, our next piece uh, also comes from Radio Times. Um, this is some uh, questions based on the blurb for episode 11. Uh, French, uh, which, do we have a, a, I don't think the article mentions the title from it, which is aggravating me because that's what I kept looking for. Um, I'm trying to remember it because I've seen it before. Uh, actually, I have the ep- I have the episode title. Just give me a moment. Okay. It is. I believe it's World Enough in Time. Ah. Uh, so uh, the blurb is: Friendship drives the Doctor into the rashest decision of his life. 
Trapped on a giant spaceship caught in the event horizon of a black hole, he witnesses the death of someone he has pledged to protect. Is there any way he can redeem his mistake? Are events already out of control? For once, time is the Time Lord's enemy. Uh, so this brings up the question, is a major character going to die? If so, which one? Uh, considering who uh, is involved in this season, I personally have to also ask, will it be a real death or will it be a fake out? I'm hoping mm. it's not going to be another fake out because we've had enough of those. Uh, we, yeah. There is the possibility that it will be a regeneration, uh, which really isn't a death, but it's enough for, you know, the summary writers to get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> seen, yes. We've definitely seen Doctor Who do a lot of fake outs when it comes to the Doctor and others witnessing people die, so that's definitely a possibility as well. Otherwise, there's a question. Um, it was uh, suggested in one of the earliest trailers that Bill might die this season, although that hasn't really, I don't think, been something that's been brought up again, but it is a possibility. Um, well, they also did the fake death in Oxygen. So they're, right, they're, they're, right, still, right. they're still at least playing with it. Mm. Yeah. If you're going to do it, just do it. Don't try to back out of it, is all I'm going to say. Mm. Just do it. The end of the episode, Bill wakes up in an alternate universe next to a blonde woman. If you're going to shoot, then shoot. <laughs> and a tall, Don't just stand around man. talking about it. <laughs> all right. Or winds, or winds up in a computer next to River Song. This is Moffat, so that'd be more likely. Sure. Uh, and then she turns <laughs> the gun on herself just to end this. Uh, Shake this at But it's, it, it's possible, or so not. we know that there's going to be a death involved in that episode, and it's going to be something that affects the Doctor profoundly. But we don't know what. But we that is want, the, and, that they're is that... and they're doing lots of little walk, walk around trying not to say what it is. But that is the official, um, you know, posted blurb for episode eleven. So that was kind of the news. Wait a minute, mm -hmm. someone he charged to protect. It could be Missy. That yes, could be Missy. That's what we've been yeah, saying. that's what we've been it saying. It could be Missy or it could mm. be Bill. We don't know which. Hmm. Well, since he also brought Nardle back, it could it even be Nardle for all we know? Nardle's more there. Nardle's to supposed him. to be protecting Nardle's more him. more the butler, more but at the same around. time, he wouldn't exist the way he is right now if it wasn't for the Doctor. Yes, I know, but mm. I think his job is to protect the Doctor, not so much the other way around. Hmm. Anyway. We do our way. Alrighty. So it's my turn. I yep. think so. All right, so we have news from Cult Box that former showrunner Russell T. Davies has claimed in an interview that he knows for a fact who the next Doctor will be, but he hasn't said who it will be. He just says he knows. Uh huh. And I have to wonder. Uh, I know uh, Steve Moffat has a reputation as being a troll, but uh, does Russell T. Davies have that? Not so much, no. He he has a reputation of saying that he knows something and then keeping it to his chest. Now he'll, here's, he'll at least say mm. he knows something, but won't tell. Now here's the thing: Chris Chibnall and Russell T. Davies used to work pretty close together back when Russell T. Davies was running Doctor Who. And that's probably how he found out, if any way. Mm -hmm. If there's any way of him knowing. That means that they still kind of move in the and shake in the same circles. Mm -hmm. So either. Mm. Russell knows the person who Chibnall has asked to be the next doctor, or Chibnall went to Russell for some advice. Either or way, thoughts on his picks. That, he has it in on it. He's not saying, but that does mean the decision has been made. They just haven't announced it yet. The decision has been made. The mm -hmm. cast has been set. It's only a matter of time before they say who is who. <laughs> Ooh, I forgot to assign that little piece of news. Hmm? Bad yeah. news. Uh, the one right after that, um, alumni news. It was. It's really just a piece. It's still uh, alumni news, news, I guess. But yeah. 
It was really just a piece of an interview with Alan Cumming, you know, the guy that played Nightcrawler in X2. Yep. And mentioned the fact that he had been offered the role of Doctor Who not once but twice and turned it down both times. Oh. So he's one of those doctors that could have been. Oh, he, really? He was, yeah. He was originally offered the role by Russell T. Davies back in like 2005 or 2006. Um, and he was all for it until he learned he was going to have to go to Cardiff to film it. And he said, no. <laughs> mm. oh. No show is worth going to Cardiff to film. <laughs> Man, and, sick burn on Cardiff. Yeah. Well, apparently it's just Wales in general that he's not too keen on. Yeah, apparently. And then he was asked again by... Um, uh, Mart Moffat and Mark Gaddis. Um and I, his response was fine I'd love to but they previously told me I have to go to Cardiff for 8 months of the year and then they said oh you still have to do that and he said I'll do anything for Doctor Who but I won't do that <laughs> I will do anything for Who but I won't <laughs> do Wales <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what his deal is. Yeah. I I heard an explanation, but I'm not sure if it's a, a, a get if it was a gag explanation or not. So I won't bother saying. <laughs> mm. He either just dislikes the area or bad experience. Yeah, bad experience was it, but I forget if it was like a, a joke bad experience that I heard, or if it was like a legit one. Hmm. Okay, sorry, I forgot to select that one. Anyway, um, so speaking of Wales, uh, Cardiff is going to be holding a special screening for episode 11 of Doctor Who, and it's complete with live music from the National Orchestra of Wales. That's the people that do the music. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be on June 24th. The episode will be screened at BBC... Hodnot Hall in Cardiff, Wales Millennium Center. It'll be followed by an onstage Q&A with some of the team behind the show, including Pearl Mackey and Stephen Moffat. Uh, the evening will be hosted by Jason Mohammed and promises monsters and surprises. So this kind of sounds like what they used to do at Albert Hall, the proms. Yeah. But with an episode screening in there. Mm-hmm. That should be cool. Um, they'll have legit let's monsters see, there. Are airs. free and will be allocated via a random ballot. Applicants need to be able to attend the event in Cardiff and make their own arrangements for travel and accommodation. To enter the ballot, you need to tweet hashtag DW Finale Countdown to at BBC Doctor Who. Actually, this might already be over. Just after 3 p.m. today, so... Oh, uh, nope. it's probably already over. Yeah, that, I ended earlier today. It wasn't <laughs> over when I wrote it, but yeah. The fact that, they get, that this broke yesterday and ended today kind of sucked. Oh, well. Next. But still, that's going to be a cool event. Aaron? Okay, going on to a uh, new DVD release, The Doctors, The Pat Troughton Years. So Cook Media is releasing this uh, with uh, interviews from uh, real-time pictures uh, featuring stars from Doctor Who. Uh, this time it's going to be about the second Doctor. It's going to be a double DVD release with a lot of... Um, Quite a few interviews, apparently. Um, this year, definitive set of interviews is what they call, they're calling it with the team of actors who brought Patrick Troughton era of Doctor to, of Doctor Who to life. So uh, let me see here. It's going to be presented by Nicholas Briggs. Uh, we'll also have interview on there with uh, Anaki Willis, of course, Polly, Michael Craze, uh, who played Ben, Fraser Hines, who played Jamie. And Deborah Watling as uh, Victoria and Wendy Padbury as Zoe. 
Yeah, it's going to be five hours long and includes a special feature uh, introduction uh, by Nicholas Briggs and producer Keith uh, Barnfather, right? All right, so and then there's also a competition associated with this one, too. Let me see here. Yep, and this one is still going on, unlike Rand's competition. So if you want to win a free copy of The Doctor's The Pat Troughton Years, courtesy of Coke Media, uh, you just have to answer the following question. Which of the second Doctor's companions traveled with him for the longest time? If you don't know this, shame. <laughs> Ping Agreed. shame. Ping well, shame. Well, either that or you don't know All the right. second Doctor. So yeah. send your answers along with your name, address, and where you heard about the competition, uh, news site, news app, other website, etc., to uh, see what comp uh comp dash coke media all one word except for the dash there at doctor who news dot net with the subject oh my word uh with an exclamation point on that and the o is capitalized so o capital my word exclamation point oh my um, I, you thought it would have been oh my giddy aunt <laughs> Never thought so. Okay, it is only this is only open for UK readers, by the way, and the closing date is thirtieth of June, twenty seventeen. Only one entry per household will be accepted. Well, well obviously it's UK case. because it's a DVD release. It's region locked. Yeah, yeah. and they're small companies, so I I wouldn't expect it otherwise. Mm hmm. Still boo. Boo, boo bear. No entertainment still, in they, they are planning subsequent Doctor uh, releases for this too. I was just looking at the fourth Doctor one, so in which case they have uh, interviews with Elizabeth Sladden and uh, Ian Martyr on there. Wow, just make me depressed. <laughs> <laughs> so next. Yep, so then we move on to Big Finish, which has such a very large amount of no, 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 they they really don't. Uh, Why but we don't do have they? We, need more. we do have two new releases for Big Finish. The first is the uh, Dual Cider uh, Wor Shadow Planet World Apart featuring the Seventh Doctor and Sophie Eldred as Ace. Shadow Planet by A.K. Benedict. Troubled, anxious, tormented by self-doubt? Come to Unity, the Psychic Planet. From our therapy center beside Unity's idyllic shores, the Unity Corporation can help you overcome all your problems. How? By using a patented combination of technology and Jungian psychology, we can bring you face to face with your shadow self, the hidden you, the dark you, the you that no one knows. Rest assured, the process is perfectly safe. Nothing can possibly go wrong, and that's guaranteed. Or your money back. Yeah, that sounds like trouble waiting to happen. World Apart by Scott Hancock. If you're reading this, it's too late. There's no way off this planet. No, uh, nothing else to that blurb. <laughs> not sure if it's a related story or not. You're already dead. Bye. You're already dead. <laughs> um, is this one... It looks like this is saying this one is also with Hex, but I didn't see him mentioned in the cast. I don't. Oh, oh, okay. Never mind. Yes. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He was. He wasn't mentioned in the top part. He was mentioned in the second paragraph. So yes, Philip Olivier is returning as Hex. Who I assume is the guy in the cover there. Actually, I don't know because I'm not that familiar with Hex. I haven't listened to any of his stories yet. Well, it's another person other than Ace and the Doctor, so... Probably, then. All right. Also out now is the fourth Doctor Adventures, Subterranea, featuring the second Romana, uh, but apparently not K-9. So that might All right, the, the TARDIS is going underground. When the Doctor and Romana find themselves buried beneath the surface of an alien world, they're soon swallowed by a giant burrowing machine. This is where the inhabitants of this planet live, in huge, constantly moving drill towns, chewing up the fuel and resources of the planet in order to survive. 
but something else lurks in the town, something that feeds on the drill towns, something that is relentless and will not stop. I'm trying to remember what that like monster or armor or whatever reminds me of. It reminds me of the lurker uh, or the liquor from uh, Resident Evil. That's what it kind of reminds me of. Hmm. Just just to make it less of a flesh monster and more of a mechanical m monster, and you got more or less the same idea. Uh, but that is all of our big finish news. It looks like yeah. a giant mechanical sand slash. Hmm. Sand slash a little bit too, yeah. It looks Just like it, it looks like Eggman roboticized the sand slash, and that's what came out of it. Sure. Crossing your video game memes right there, and there's some fan fiction for that somewhere. Oh, I almost guarantee it. <laughs> Where do you think the Pokemon came from in the first place? <laughs> Alrighty, so that's our news. Oh, actually, no, there's one more piece. Well, one, one more piece, uh, trivia. Or not, tri uh, 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 not a trivia thing, but... Uh, the Doctor Who experience in Cardiff will be closing its doors. Uh, well, we already we already knew that. The new part is the fact that we now know the date. Yep. On uh, September 9th this year. Here. Yep. So that's a Saturday. And tickets to the last show will be uh, sold, will go on sale uh, this Friday, June 16th. 16th, uh, midday. And there'll be Oh. Hold on, I'm trying to bring up the, the tab. Uh, my computer's stuck. Uh, but they did say that they did a poll, and of all the monsters and the costumes that they most wanted to see, it was the Yeti from Web of Fear was <laughs> the clear winner. So... So yeah, they're going to be unveiling that. And as far as we're aware, there's no replacement place for the Doctor Who experience, so this is pretty much going to be it as far as we're aware at the moment. Yep, everything will be yeah. put back into into storage. Yep. And wait until they either find a side to open mm -hmm. up a new experience or just stay there until someone decides to pull them mm -hmm. up for like a museum piece or something. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. It says the finished exhibition will be unveiled on July 8th. Mm-hmm. And that's the same guy that uh, recently did the Ice Warrior mask that we reported last week. Mm -hmm. So apparently uh, the one that re has restored the Yeti. So that's cool. And for you cosplayers, apparently on the 5th of August, they're going to have the biggest Doctor Who Experience cosplay <laughs> celebration yet. They want everybody to come in dressed up. As their favorite Doctor Who character or monster. Uh, if I could be, I would be there as an 80 Cyberman. And you might actually want to do that on the 22nd of July. That's their their final monster event with the Cybermen as the theme. Excellent. Their um, Monster Makers Millennium FX will be there. Chance for fans to be cyber converted, as well as live Mondazian Cybermen roaming the experience floor. <laughs> And that is to coincide, apparently, with the finale, I think. Or just after the finale, either way. But yeah, it's going to be a sad day when we lose the experience. It was always my goal when I got a job and saved up enough money was I was going to fly over to Cardiff and go to the experience, and now I can't, so I'm sad. But your goal was to fly to Cardiff and kick Stephen Moffat in the dick. That's the no. secondary goal. 
No, that was if Stephen Moffat happened to be at the experience at the same time I was there. Aha. Uh -huh. I would have to kick him in the dick. And this is for Jerry to the center of the TARDIS. And, I, and I, I think I think after Sleep No More, we were uh, we were talking about kickstarting a chance for me to fly to England to kick Moffat in the dick. <laughs> oh God, that was bad. Uh, but donate today. Doesn't happen. He's announced his retirement now, so it's like okay, I'll I'll, I'll deal with it. I'll suck it up for another remainder of a season. And one more Christmas special, and then we're on to Chibnall, so hey. Crossing fingers. Okay. So anybody have anything that's happened to them in the last week that they want to talk about briefly? We've got about five minutes. Adam West, I cried. Oh, yes, we all <laughs> cried. Yep. I had an interesting story about Adam West. I uh, got to see him last week, not last year. But uh, say what? I, went, uh, I saw him at a panel last year at Megacon, and the thing that struck my mind is, uh, someone asked him, if you could be uh, play a Marvel character, who would you want to play? And he said, oh, I'm not familiar with the Marvel characters, uh, can you name some of them? The guy who asked questions said, well, there's the Hulk, and he said, the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that just uh, just uh, captured my imagination, and now I, I have this mental image in my head of Adam West playing the Incredible Hulk. Not Bruce Banner, the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> well, you know, if I had been at that convention, I would have had to speak up at that point and saying, hey, hey, bad Adam West. No thinking of injecting yourself with gamma radiation to try to get Hulk powers. No, bad Adam. Just give you cancer. <laughs> How about being Iron Man? It's essentially the same thing as being Batman, only you get to fly. Uh, he seemed really gung-ho about playing the Hulk. I'm sure the idea amuses him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what did Adam West die of? Are we aware? Uh, it said it was leukemia. Oh. Uh. Uh. It said just he had a brief battle with it. So yeah, it was cancer, actually. <sighs> Acted in the 1960s and 70s, what can I say? I just, I had, I hadn't actually heard it reported on any of his, any of the things I saw about him, so I was curious. So you finally found something that said so? Yep. I will also say, as one last little mention for Adam West, at least he got to play the Batman one last time. Yes, he did. That probably made his that probably made his year. Hmm. Oh, it probably made his lifetime. Just the fact that people wanted to see him back in the role still. Mm-hmm. Because I hear it did really well. Actually, he got two of them. Hmm. He got Return of the Caped Crusaders and Batman vs. Two Face. Mm. Did he have the latter of which he yeah like uh, there was like a thing recently where it said that he had they they confirmed that he had con finished his recording oh. for the, the latter the latter mm -hmm. so he got to record a second um, one did he ever get go against Two Face I don't think he ever went against Two Face originally don't think so no I'm sure he's probably aware of the character though by this point mm -hmm. but. Let's mm -hmm. see. Adam West is Bat Bruce Wayne Batman, Bruce Ward is Dick Grayson Robin, Julie Newmar is Catwoman, Jeff Bergman is Joker announcer, so cause of course they can't get the Joker. Mm -hmm. William Sallers as Penguin, because they can't get Burgess Meredith. Mm -hmm. Wally Winger as the Riddler. Also, I think the original Riddler is dead. Mm -hmm. Jim Ward as James Gordon. 
funny. Two Face isn't actually mentioned in the cast. <laughs> Weird. Oh it's wait, that's, that's that's Return of the Cape Crusaders. Never mind. Oh, wrong one then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're reading the wrong one then. <laughs> uh, actually, the uh, versus Two Face uh, um, is listed as the sequel under Return of the Cape Crusaders. It doesn't give a separate listing. Doesn't give a separate uh, listing. Even uh, though so there's actually plan, it's, it's planned to be it's planned to be released this year. He finished his his, his stuff. So, uh, so he gave us a parting involved. gift. He's. It's actually probably not going to get released till early 2018. So it'll be the final thing Adam West did. God bless you, Adam West. So apparently, if uh, if the 60s Batman show wasn't canceled when it was, Clint Eastwood was going to come in, I guess, as Dent and then Two Face. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. That would have been a kind of interesting Harvey Dent. Yeah, Clint Eastwood is Two Face. <laughs> that actually kind of worked back then. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> of course, I get the mental image of Clint Eastwood flipping the coin. It's like, so Batman, feel lucky, punk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I also believe okay. the most grim season of the series ever made to that point, though, too, if they're having Two Face in there, because that's some dark, serious stuff. Why? You say that, that but then you think about Schumacher's Two Face. Uh, <laughs> well, the, oh, that just and and Schumacher was trying to emulate the tone of the '60s Batman show. You know, he recently posted a public apology Again. for Batman and Robin. Yeah. <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, like I said, again. He has been apologizing for like the last fifteen years about that movie. But those both I guess, of those I, movies. I, I guess the reception was too cold. Oh. Oh, <laughs> he he publicly issued an apology for every fan disappointed in Batman and Robin. Mm. Uh Bill, I think after making that pun you're on ice. <laughs> Both of you just knock it off because we need to go to the five minute challenge. Okay, I guess we'll chill. <laughs> You're only about a two hour drive away, Matt. <laughs> Don't make me drive up there and kill you. Because there will be blood, <laughs> it will be yours. So go kill someone, sign bad horse. Um. Okay, five minute challenge. I believe last week I volunteered to do this. I'm regretting that now, but I, mm -hmm. I volunteered. Yeah, I believe you actually did volunteer mm -hmm. for this week, so I have the stopwatch ready whenever you are. Oh, let me click. Uh... Okay. All right, ready? Yep. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so we start first start off at NASA, where they are testing their latest Mars probe, hoping to see through the polar cap uh, to see what's underneath. Their uh, launch of the camera is interrupted slightly by the Doctor, Bill, and Nardle, who have shown up inexplicably at Cape Canaveral uh, and is kind of interrupting things. However, the pictures do come through, and through the ice, they can clearly see the words, God save the Queen which amuses the Doctor to no end. The Doctor, uh, discovering where it originates from, goes to Mars in the year 1881 and lands in a series of subterranean tunnels underneath the planet. Um, much to his shock, he discovers there's air, oxygen down there, mostly because they find a lit campfire and Nardle takes off his helmet. Uh, Bill, rooting around and making a few movie references that the Doctor does not get, suddenly falls down a pit. Nardle goes into the TARDIS to get some rope and other climbing gear, but the TARDIS inexplicably decides to take off, leaving the Doctor and Bill stranded on Mars, where they suddenly discover is full of soldiers, British soldiers. Colonial, er, colonial British, no, not colonial, imperial British soldiers of the 19th century who are on Mars and are friends with an ice warrior whom they call Friday. A little bit later, they're explaining to him that, or they're explaining to the Doctor and Bill that they had discovered Friday 
uh, frozen on Earth, thought him out, found his ship, helped them repair it, and made the trip to Mars in order to basically make the planet a colony of the British Empire and loot any gold, gems, or valuables they can find because that's what the British Army does. Uh, we are first introduced to the, uh, what was his name? Captain, help me out here. Nobody... I just remember, I remember their names as the Colonel, the Captain. I don't even remember the, actually the name of the other guy. Oh, wow, this is, you're making it tough for me. <laughs> okay, because I had this all and I've lost it. Um, uh. It is Captain, or excuse me, um, Catchlove is his name. Yeah. Neville Catchlove. Yes. And he is very much of the pro imperial expansionist Britain's uh, uh, Britain view, but his view is tempered by his commander, Colonel Godsacre. If I'm saying that wrong, excuse me. Um, shortly after they arrive, their big, huge machine, the Gargantua, uh, Bless, which is basically apparently the laser cannons off the spaceship, moved into a mobile battery, blasts open a uh, chamber on Mars where they discover what looks to be a Egyptian-style tomb of what the doctor describes as being an ice warrior hive queen. Um, Cat, uh, uh, God's Acres uh, puts two people there and wants to take a look at it in the morning. Unfortunately, a young soldier by Jackdaw, or named Jackdaw, sees gold and wealth and wants to claim it for himself. He subdues, he subdues one of the guards, intimidates the other, and starts chipping uh, gems off the... Uh, casket which awakens the hive queen because she was only in suspended animation the uh, English soldiers upon first seeing her open fire and as a result are blasted into uh, well compression what would you call that they're basically trash compacted mm. um, the doctor tries to form a peace between her and the, the soldiers uh, but that doesn't work out too well, <clears throat> as another of the soldiers eventually opens fire on her, and she declares war. They fire the Gargantua over the roof, uh, trapping her and Friday uh, in her crypt, while she decides to make the move to awaken her ice warriors. Meanwhile, uh, Catchlove... Uh, reveals to everybody that God's Acre is unfit to command because he was hung as a deserter just the hanging failed and is therefore replaced in command as he declares to go to war with the Ice Warriors of course they really don't stand a chance as things start opening up Friday manages to dig his way to where the Doctor, Bill and God's Acre are uh, basically locked away by them and managed to try to broker a peace with the doctor and says he needs their help to stop this. Um, they come out. The Empress, uh, Bill distracts the Empress by trying to talk peace while the doctor takes over the Gargantua and points it at the ceiling, uh, threatening her to stand down because if they don't, he will fire it and trap them all under ice, much like Frozen. The Empress eventually capitulates. The Doctor hooks up a basically a subspace radio, which uh, gets in touch with Alpha Centauri, who offers the Ice Warriors a chance to survive as part of the Galactic Federation. Uh, and in a final way of self uh, self sacrifice to stop the battle between the Ice Warriors and the humans, God's Acre kills Catch Love, and then offers himself us to Ice Warrior justice. The Empress, in turn, makes Catchla or makes God's Acre serve her, and it's the Doctor and God's Acre that put down the God Save the Queen at the end of the episode. Also, the TARDIS gets back to Mars because Nardle enlists the help of Missy, who comes out and drives the TARDIS to Mars and wonders if there's something wrong with the Doctor. End. And I'm over time. Very much so. You got it in 6 minutes, 27 seconds. Yeah, there was that huge pause because we couldn't remember the name of anybody. 
Uh, yeah, I would have just except, gone forward Jack, saying the, the Jack though. I really yeah, I didn't like. I said the same like twenty times. Yeah. <laughs> I would have just gone forward saying the captain and the colonel. Cause... I I I didn't want to do that because otherwise they're it's they're too much. Uh, it, they're too faceless. Ah. Mm. Okay. So we're going to go through what we liked about this episode. And Tim is up first. Yay, first. I really liked uh, the presentation of the British soldiers uh, in this episode and how it was sort of like how they would acclimated to the idea of aliens from another planet and being on another planet. And still managed to maintain their Victorian values. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was a very, uh, you know, in that uh, line where Bill said, uh, I'll forgive you for being Victorian because you are Victorian. <laughs> you know, when, Yeah, uh, that's when he was scoffing at a woman being a, a police officer. Because, yes, they may be embracing the concept of aliens, but they're still Victorian. <laughs> <laughs> It was yeah. uh, done right, just right to be amusing to me. Yeah, and they got some of the ter terminology right, too. As I'm listening to them talking about the colonel and how he did the Newberry polka. Hmm. Um, Newgate. Newgate polka, and that was a reference to Newgate Prison in London, ah. which was basically the source of all hangings in London. Although from... they did use the term ain't, and I can't imagine that that was very... Yeah. yeah. Common. Yeah. Ain't. But uh, that was a, a question I'd raised. Like, uh, if they tried to hang someone and they they muck it up, uh, do they just say, oh, well, I guess you can go and live? Or... Yeah. <laughs> just be on your way. I guess it failed to hang you. You're, un <laughs> you're unhangable. Story of Jack Sparrow's um, life. So here's your command back. Actually, <laughs> right? British lower class would use ain't. Ah, but would it's, would it's a been it's been be in the lower class? Um, depending on where he came from. It, it oh. could be that now that he's reached mm. captain, he's preened himself up better, but he could still have some by, dialect. By this mm. point, um, ain't has been around a hundred years. So Believe it or not, around. it's been it's been around since the 18th century. Oh yeah, remember Liza Doolittle? Oh, I ain't... <laughs> oh, ain't nothing but a flower girl. And it was the British that actually browned it to the Americans. So I, I mean, I, I guess if he had like a Cockney accent, it would have made sense and it wouldn't have raised any question, but like he sounded upper class to me, or at least... Yeah. Borderline. Again, yeah, he, he sort of threw me off. Upper class for sh uh, is my assumption. Anyway, um, Bill, what was your best part of the episode? Your favorite part? I'm gonna say I like. Yeah, what, what did you like about it overall? Yeah, I like the distinct personalities of the uh, of the Victorians. Yeah, you know the yeah the, the the colonel, the captain, the sergeant, and the two privates that each had. I think there were two privates. That each had, you know, their own motives, their own fears, their own personalities. It was very inter you know, interesting in that way. Some of them were archetypical, but that's fine. Yeah. It's still yeah. better than no personality or all the same personality, right. which has mm -hmm. been plaguing a lot yeah, of yeah. Moffat's work of late. And yeah, like if Jack Dor was like a major character that took up, you know, as much time as well actually, I mean, even I guess the the captain was kind of an archetype, but it was played out in a you know a way that kept the story going and not an mm. unbelievable groan worthy way. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's. I actually mentioned that earlier. It's a lot better than um, what we've seen of late. Like when we got to see Bill's friends, there mm. wasn't a lot of personality. Yeah, like you couldn't them. really distinguish between them very easily unless you know. You paid very close attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. 
and here everybody was distinct and well done and that's really Gaddis can do that but he has to put a little work into it and he actually did his work this time he he's he's great at putting he's great at uh doing personalities but he's had issues with motives before and i think he's finally fixed that so yay Gaddis. um matt going on on a high note for Gaddis. um so um I'm the visual guy. I guess I'll go with the uh, the makeup effects for this one in particular. I, I like the uh, the different. Uh, I swear, Friday as he's got a battle scar and everything from apparently doing battle beforehand. Uh, I like the new uh, additional new helmet work as well as new facial makeup for the uh, queen or the empress rather. Um, uh, the uh, we I don't I think we've had the ice warriors once before. This yeah, season? only oh. only one. Uh, not this season, but generally once, once, once before, before this. Season. this uh, yeah, Cold it was a couple War. series ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cold War. And we only literally had which was, only one by the way, warrior. another Gaddis. Yeah, we literally only had mm-hmm. one Ice Warrior. So the fact that we got a slew of Ice Warriors, they all actually look really decently done. The armor actually looks like armor these days, and the makeup effects actually move properly and our actual on-face prosthetics actually help a lot, so the Ice Warriors are definitely mm-hmm. going, going in a good direction. About the previous Ice Warrior one being Gaddis, at this point we've now had two black and white Ice Warrior stories written by the same person, two Peladon Ice Warrior stories written by the same person, and two uh, Modern Who Ice Warrior stories written by the same person. <laughs> I'm wondering if we're going to get another two from the next Ice Warrior writer. <laughs> Seem to have a pattern going. Anyway, Aaron. Hmm. Well, I enjoyed some of the kind of more intense, um, what do you call it? The more intense moments where the doctor's trying to negotiate. And I don't know, I thought those went pretty well or when when they're also trying to deceive the Victorians and try not to let anything on and kind of doing it badly but uh, <laughs> I, I thought that was pretty good you know and uh, like just when he's confronted by the ice warrior at first he's like you're, you don't know what to expect it kind of there are some scenes that have you on the edge of your seat and mm-hmm. I think the negotiation scenes and the dialogue were pretty good That's it for me. All right. Um, Thomas. Um, I I think I was going to say some of the stuff that was already taken, but thankfully I had a backup. Um, I like the fact that even though Nardole kind of buggers off early on, that he doesn't just completely disappear from, like oh, he goes away in the TARDIS, and then we don't see him again until the TARDIS returns. We actually get bits and pieces throughout showing him dealing with the issue and going to Missy for help. Um, so part of this reason was the fact that this was um, the light episode for uh, the actor, suddenly my brain dies on what his name uh, is. Lucas. Matt Lucas. Yeah. Um, and he actually spent a lot of that time in Miami on vacation <laughs> while everyone else was freezing their butts off in the tunnels around Bristol, which is where they filmed the scenes in Mars. He's in Miami lounging around and writing. You know, I could see him in character just doing that. Like, I could just see him, like, shoot some clips, be like, yeah, it's me, Nardole. I went on vacation. Forget the doctor. He was sat off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, like hard to work. So I'm just gonna take a break. I'll catch you guys. Like, a, a Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, like I guess I mean generally like the fact that if you look at, I don't know if they've done it too much, but there have been episodes early where like, I think Smile is probably one where he's kind of there at the start, but then they bugger off without him, and then come back, and it's like, it's nice 
to have like he's not there, but he's at least still kind of got something to do. Mm-hmm. Oh, that reminds me. You know what that note that said that he was stepping back for Missy in the last in the finale too means that Nardle is here all the way through. Yeah. So. Hey, Nardle. <laughs> I mean, and I think we, we've had we, one. We or... thought he would only make it like one episode in. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we thought he'd be out by like episode three or four. Just <laughs> it's like he's in good hands. I'm done. I'm gone. And nope, he's been a uh, uh, pretty regular uh, part of the thing. And I'm wondering. I'm actually curious if Nardle's actually going to be the one to move fo- forward into the next season. Maybe. Maybe he's the one constant right now. Mm. It'd be like K-9. It'll be the Dr. Nardle and another companion switching off every season or so. Hmm. Well, I, I, I do... Nardle is like freaking the Doctor's Alfred, and I, I kind of appreciate that. Okay. So, what I liked is... I really liked the world building they did with the Ice Warriors. We actually got to see them start developing some some more information behind the Ice Warrior Society and everything, mm-hmm. more than we'd seen in recent times, and that was some really nice stuff. Mm-hmm. They had a war. Yeah, it was act good information, and they almost wiped themselves out with that war, which apparently. is why, which is apparently why so many Ice Warriors crashed on Earth. Apparently, and got frozen. Um, so we've learned a little and bit they more. they froze themselves like Cybermen. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're reptiles, so they can do that whole suspended animation thing. I wouldn't mm. think it'd last thousands of years, but what the fuck do I know? They're aliens from Mars. <laughs> they hey, know better than if, us. <laughs> if they, they've frozen themselves in ice on Earth for thousands of years by accident and then woken up and been just cool, just cool so no pun intended. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So You're giving me chills, Bill. Chills. Ah, gosh. <laughs> All right. So, what didn't you like about this episode? And we're starting with Tim. Oh, uh, you know me. I didn't like the absence of Nardle. <laughs> <laughs> Even though, like, uh, they did the best they could to keep them there as much as they could and I can't begrudge uh, Matt Lucas having fun in Miami but still (laughs) you hear that Matt Lucas no more vacays (laughs) Bill what about you what didn't you like about the episode so around the third act or so the story went from being uh, from having a like a monster movie uh, or a mummy movie vibe to just being more of a generic alien shoot 'em up thing for a while with you know with the diplomacy added, but that was basically the thing. And I wasn't a fan of that part. I you know I kind of liked how it was going and the feel with you know it feeling like a universal monster movie, and then it just kind of took that left turn and became a lot more generic. All right, so you didn't like that ge- the genericness of that final act. Yeah. All right, Matt, how about you? What didn't you like about the episode? Uh, actually, uh, the one thing I think I didn't care for was that uh, there's so many cookie-cutter red shirt soldiers around that when they start getting killed later, you really don't kind of feel it. Except for, like, maybe a few characters that we actually got to know and actually liked. They were mm-hmm. literally red shirts. Yup. <laughs> yes. Because red was the uh, was the British military of the time. The red shirts are coming. The red shirts are coming. <laughs> well, don't put them in Star Trek, or they're all gonna die. All right, Aaron. Um, I didn't like the ball effect. I thought that just looked so corny. Like when they get shoot when they get shot by the um. By the rays from the um from the ice warriors and stuff like that. I don't know. It felt I, I, it felt I, I like won't... it was just kind of corny. Like I guess they're trying to manipulate. I guess they've manipulated the gravity around them to crush the people into little balls. 
but which just makes sense of the so... old school sound. But yeah, this th they needed to hammer that effect down a bit it's, better. It's a yeah. tissue compression thingy. It's, that's it's not even tissue anything. compression. That would make them into miniature dolls. Yes, it, it would. That's the thing. A tissue compression thingy that doesn't quite eliminate. No, 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 yeah. no. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a compactor. It, 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 seems like, it, it feels like, I don't know, it just feels like... It's a laser like... compactor. Shut <laughs> down all the garbage masters on the Ice Warrior level. I think they would be the type of people who would just disintegrate their enemies so there's less to clean up, basically. I think that's what they've always done in uh, the past. Previously, they just had a laser beam that sounded like they literally like blew you okay. inside out. So, the origin behind this is the fact that Gaddis remembered the special effect that they used for the Ice Warriors back in the day. Which, which is, a is that effect. they... Yes, well, they used to take a image of somebody on like a... Uh, like a sheet of uh, thin reflective material, and then they would poke the material and make it do that weird Ripley effect. Mm -hmm. And he wanted something to be just as cool. Unfortunately, he didn't succeed. No, this is not quite the yeah. way. What, what, it, it, it was more comical than anything. If I was to <laughs> judge what they should do is that they should keep the old school sound effect because that sounded like... It sounded like a laser beam that hits you so dang hard that it's practically knocking you to shreds. But mm -hmm. but keep it like old school enough that we can't, we're, not, we're not getting in trouble with the sensors. Because mm. that, that sound effect... The, the laser beams need to be updated, but I think the sound effect is the one thing that can stay. And, and crushing them like that doesn't quite work unless you do something a bit better with it. And it's either that it's either looking silly like that or not doing the effect at all. Yeah, it, was, it, it looks a little more parody than yeah, it looked and, more. And, it looked it looked campy. Yeah, yeah. And less campy would probably be suiting them better, especially as a threat. Mm. All right, Thomas. What about you? What did you like about it? <sighs> um. God. <laughs> what haven't we done? Like, uh, like the the funny thing is, like I did. I think it was more so just like, as far as overall stuff, I don't think I can really pin anything down. So I'm just gonna pass. Okay. okay. I didn't like the fact that the British soldiers were so overly familiar with Ice Warrior tech that they could rig it into a basically a mobile drill platform. I think Friday I thought they said that. Friday yeah. yeah was involved. Yeah, in but that. then you but then you see this one soldier with goggles on basically setting it up it's like, okay, it's ready to go and I'm like Well, they've been probably doing this for how long? I know, it just yeah. bothered me. Yeah. I, I think that's hey, uh, I think that's a nitpick. Would it, it have helped if they had said that they... everything else? Would it have helped if they had said, oh, you know, we've been here a year and this is literally the only guy who can figure it out? The only guy that understands how to make this one thing work, so yeah. let him run it. I mean, they had been there long enough that they Maybe. were running low on rations by then. Yeah. But the age, the interest of Asian pop culture, his name would have had to have been Sid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but so... Sid have lived, though. <laughs> I don't know if Sid with a C... Actually, it probably was is generic enough that it would work in that era as well. So, uh, best scene, uh, starting with Tim. I love the scene where uh, Bill and the Colonel like sort of like face off, and the Colonel scoffs at Bill uh, being a police, police officer, but uh, then they sort of like... Uh, get over that hump and uh, the colonel confides into Bill about like the story behind his desertion because I thought that was a very human touching scene scene about uh, overcoming uh, uh, prejudice in a strange way way that but it wasn't too heavy handed All right. And Bill? So I'm going to go with this. I mean, this scene is, you know, it's probably generic as hell and has been done a million times. 
but that classic monster movie scene where Jack Dor is, you know, stealing the gems and the Empress just wakes up and she's like, and now you die. <laughs> Stole my stuff, and now you die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very much the mummy. Yeah. All right, uh, Matt, how about you, favorite scene? Uh... I I I have to say I love the the Ice Warriors first contact with another alien race of humans. God damn it! <laughs> Are you talking about the Alpha Centauri? Yes. Yeah. Yep. The Alpha Centauri just mm. the fact that they got the original voice actress. They got to the, come they, back they did get the original at voice the actress age of ninety two. <gasps> Nice. To come and do the audio as Alpha Centauri. <laughs> she is now the oldest person to make a contribution to Doctor Who after beating out Christopher... Oh, wait, was it Christopher Lee? No, it was Ian McKellen. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been Ian McKellen. I don't think Christopher Lee was ever in Doctor Who, sadly. No. No, I was trying to remember which one it was because, you know, those two are always competing. <laughs> Stuff. Brief brief thing, I didn't check my email till just now, but we just got a uh, a new follower. So thank you, uh Vixi, for following uh, an unearthly podcast on Twitch. Glad to have you. Is it isn't that Vexi? Or Vexi? I don't know. V E E X I. Yeah, that's yeah. Vexi. That's that's Vexi. <laughs> or that's how I've been pronouncing it. That's, um... that's one of Matt's followers. That's one of my yeah, followers okay. and I was I believe Vexi was there at the uh stream last night when we were mentioning the podcast, so Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vexy's oh, okay. watching the podcast, maybe. Okay. So, I think you just got. I think best scene just for that was mine, Matt's, and Aaron's all together yes. on that one. Because <laughs> yeah, that was my that was my absolutely favorite scene. The fact that they got her out at ninety two to do that is unbelievable. That, that and I love the expression on the uh uh. Uh, the Empress's face as she's making contact with this being and hearing this okay. voice for the first time and you just slowly okay. see her going, what is this thing? I have it, Although I, have... I do think it was a little over the top when she looked at the audience like, huh? Huh? But, I mean, she was looking at the doctor, but even still it felt a little OTT. It felt a little meta. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, no, I, I do have another one, but uh, Aaron, did you have a different favorite scene? Uh, let me see here. Home through... Anything else? Um, I did enjoy the fact that the queen turned to Bill for a uh, consultation, although she didn't seem too annoyed by all the uh, dudes giving her advice. So, <laughs> all right, Thomas. Yeah. Um, thankfully neither of the options I had were taken, but obviously I'm gonna... just name one for now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but it was. The scene fairly early on where Bill falls down the hole and you know, like in any other show or possibly in any other Doctors' run, they'd probably be a bit jokey about that. But and like be like, Haha, we'll we'll get you out, and it'll be fine or whatever. But instead he's the doctor's like, Oh shit. We need to sort this out, like, right now. We need to get Bill back. Like, well, just the urgency there. I feel. I think like he's the... nervous being on Mars. I think yeah. The, I think the third it's like doctor, being on Starro. I think the mm. third Doctor would have been more, Bill, we'll get you out there, Bill, and then probably make a crack about it after they got her back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that was always kind of his kind of way. Yeah, the third Doctor would probably Action get a bad doctor. Action now, humor. Oh, you, look, you look better for the wear. <laughs> <laughs> And then kindly suggest her to move ahead of her as they follow the soldiers into the next or, room. Or possibly mm. a crack about clumsiness and then get her out and mm -hmm. then... <laughs> Something like that, but it's generally, generally Third Doctor was action first, humor after the fact. Mm -hmm. mm. He, he, he was a one-liner Doctor. <laughs> I don't mean the humor, I mean he, he wasn't above snapping at someone for making a mistake. Yeah, I know, but usually mm. if they're in danger, he was usually action first. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. So my favorite scene was right at the beginning, the NASA scene when they first see the God Save the Queen, and Capaldi breaks into this grin. 
<laughs> this child that makes him look like, like an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> Time for adventure, oh wait! <laughs> by, like by Charlie the... looking at the Wonka factory. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm really glad you mentioned that scene because there, I wasn't sure how to bring it into the conversation. Any other era of Doctor Who pre Moffat would have taken somewhere between 10 and 40 minutes to get to that point. Whereas Moffat manages, you know, with the changes made during the Moffat era, that manages to happen in the pre credit scene. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That Even in RTD, <laughs> that would have taken at least 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, in the first, you know, in a in an old school Doctor Who serial, their landing at NASA would have been the entire first episode. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it wouldn't be NASA. It would have been the British Space Administration, or something that in the twenty first century, or something like that. Mm -hmm. In the fake twenty first century. And they just would have had to stumble on the room just in time to see that, and you would have had the second doctor going, "Oh my word!" or something like that. But yeah, you know. But you, you, I must admit, there was questions. I still have questions on why the fuck they were there. But right. yes, that that expression though on Capaldi's face was just amazing. That's like the second episode in a row where he's gone and had a, a different smile with a different that can be interpreted in a different way. So, <laughs> all right, worst scenes. Tim, you are up first. What is your least favorite scene? Uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, just the fact that the uh, guy who was stealing the jewels didn't notice the bright flashing lights right in front of him. And yeah, that it, it it is a good callback to like the classic monster scenes, but still, that was a bit much for me. Yeah, the just the obliviousness about it. Too busy uh, paying attention to his own greed. <laughs> and you know, who would have been great for this for for that particular role? Were he not dead? Who would you have cast in that role of Jack Daw? And this is general. Mark Shepard would have been great, but Doctor Who's used him already. That's not who I was thinking of, but yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Anybody else want to give a suggestion? Must have top mm. my head. Mm. Oh, are you talking about existing Doctor Who characters or just no, actors no, in general? No, no, just okay. actors in general. My vote would have been for Bob Hoskins not dead because yeah. it's a very Bob Hoskins-y role hmm. yeah anybody anybody remember Bob Hoskins yeah oh yeah from uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit and also mm. was Smee in Hook and I remember as a kid watching he did a voice day uh, character a cartoon called The Forgotten Toys something like that. Hmm. Oh yeah, he was on the... I actually own that on DVD, The Forgotten Toys. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. aside Joanna Lumley, from what I can remember. It, it, just that whole role just seemed to me as something Bob Hoskins would have done, so... Could have. Mm. And uh, Bob Hoskins would have pull, pulled it off with a little better bit of comedy where he's just looking at this and you see the lights behind him or stuff. <laughs> but we're digressing anyway. Bill, your least favorite scene. All right, so the scene that first comes to mind, and I'm hesitant to say this because with this sort of scene, it's probably more likely that I missed an like a, a moment of it that was purely visual and just didn't watch the episode enough times to catch it. But I never got why Nardole fast returned back to Earth. Uh, he ran in. He, he didn't. The he the ran. The TARDIS in, just goofed. No, I mean, like, why the TARDIS yeah. with him in it did? Pads is my only suggestion. Hmm. But I'm not sure. I'm not actually quite sure why my. Okay, so it wasn't. It wasn't like he bumped a button and I just didn't see it. <laughs> no, uh, the, no, 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 no. Literally, the, the, he's the walking TARDIS in the just switches said it's moving on off, basically. Yeah. Okay, so I can kind of stand by that because the didn't make a whole ton of sense and it, like if he had 
like been grabbing, you know, some ropes and had, uh, tri- you know, tripped over something and hit the fast return button, that would have made more sense to mm-hmm. me. And having not mm. seen that, that's why I said that. But yeah, if, if nothing like that happened, then definitely I would go with well, that scene. I, I I do hope that they do explain it eventually here in the, in the next episode, but I'm not holding my breath either. Mm. Yeah, the fact that this is a Moffat. Explain. Moffat will explain. Explain <laughs> or get off the pot. This is Moffat. When does he explain anything? <sighs> Exactly go Chibnall's got problem. this. <laughs> anyway. All right. So. Bills? Yes, that yep. was Bills. So we are moving on to you, Matt. Um, I bet you I'm going to be stealing somebody's. The full, the full body shot of compacting into a brick. Mm. I'm sorry. Every time I see it, I just like... <clears throat> No, I want, I want, I want to, I want to have it, and I want to dub in the G one Transformers transformation sound. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually also willing to put uh, that, in that would have been Minecraft a perfect bump if for not Bob. for what happened. I'm also willing to add in the Minecraft, a Minecraft uh, block breaking sound. <laughs> Autobots transform. <laughs> 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 transform, do the transform transformation sound, but then I'll say I don't Wilhelm scream. <laughs> Ow, my spine! Yeah. Okay, Aaron, how about you? Least favorite scene? Mm, I look at Strew and I think, um, I think pretty much everything's that I had a problem with it has already been mentioned, so I'm just going to defer to the idea that Matt stole my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Matt, with the steal. Thomas, how about you? Um, the, the scene that I have that, like, as far as worst scenes go, that I've basically decided on is mainly one that I've picked for a reason I've probably brought up for a previous... It's like it's probably a scene that I'm picking because of similar reasons that I have prior. Um, and it is the one where... Oh, God, what's his name? Vinci is, like, talking to whoever. I forget exactly who, um, name-wise. Um, uh, about how he's going to get married and they're going to like what church they're going to do and all this and it's like yeah he's gonna die <laughs> like it's and one I've of only those got really days in, until it, retirement yeah oh, exactly it's like uh, it's just like that kind of stuff especially with like the um, the ice warrior even coming up through the ground as they're talking about it um but yeah generally that bit is just like uh, Really? Did you really have to, like, really hit it on the head that hard? <laughs> uh. Yeah, that is that is kind of a trope. The one that starts breaking down and talks about what's he's what what what's his plans are for the future, and makes it mm. sound all sympathetic and shit. We know he's gonna die. That's a freaking trope, right even, there. Even more so when we yeah. see the enemy starting to walk into the room. Hmm. Of course, it would almost gain a point back for God. I hope I never have to see green again. And a green person comes up. No, he said he never want to see red, red, again, again. red again. And he's talking about liking green. He like he. Yeah. Okay, that was it. He talks about like he wants to see green again, yeah. and then a green guy is the last thing he sees, basically. Wah, 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 wah. Wah. It's not easy being green. <laughs> <laughs> you have a laser on your wrist. <laughs> okay, so my least favorite scene. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to go with uh, the the whole Nardle Tardis thing as well, just because no explanation. Mm-hmm. And you know, it might be that we get an explanation next episode or the episode after, but. Other than that, it's kind of mm. hokey. 
Yeah, yeah. unless it's just a hokey reason to get Missy out of the cage. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's kind of annoying, so... Muffa, explain right. this. Although, so, between this and the uh, two episodes ago, you start to wonder if the TARDIS just doesn't like Nardole. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. God damn it, what are you doing back here, you dick? <laughs> Get out of me. We're going back Every home time now. he's alone in the TARDIS, it malfunctions. <laughs> just hates All him right. so much, it jives the bonkers. Hate you. Hate you. Hate your little bald head and Pudgy face, go away! <laughs> you little, little Eggman, get out of me! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, final thoughts. Tim, you're up first. Final thoughts. I thought this was a great episode uh, with uh, good characters, good story arc. Uh, a little lacking on uh, the Nardle part, but other than that. Uh, Stellar. All right. Bill? Okay. Uh, pretty good episode. Uh, it doesn't quite borrow as much from Tomb of the Cybermen as Victory of the Daleks did from Power, although there are certainly some similarities, but it's more likely they drew from similar inspirations than actually being a ripoff. Uh, Speaking of uh, the Daleks, the whole thing, uh, I don't know if Gaddis has a fetish for being served tea by monsters or what. <laughs> um, but all that together, it was a pretty enjoyable episode. You know, very much made me feel like I was watching, you know, a universal mummy film until we got to be all lasers and roll-up balls at the end. <laughs> uh, so I would say, in general, pretty successful episode and one of Gaddis's uh, better you know, the host of the after show said that they, she had a, uh, um, she had a very sick desire to play football with one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Which also again leads Crane to how campy they look. Hmm. Okay. So Matt. Uh, overall, uh, aside from a few little things that need to be re retooled again, because again, we're slowly working into getting peeling back the layers and ice warriors and new who apparently, um, and we've gotten to this point. Other than a few retoolings, I think it's a fairly decent story that explains most of what goes on, not all of it, sadly, and is actually a. Uh, a well-told story that comes full circle by the end and leaves us hanging for what the next episode's going to be. Mm. All right. Aaron? I was actually presently pleasantly surprised by the story. Um, I had actually forgotten that it was um, that it was done by Mark Gaddis. Uh, I felt that it is a little bit cliche in some areas, but uh, I think the cliche parts are done well enough that, you know, that they all work, and that he doesn't really change too much. He kind of follows a, a formula for the first half, and also a formula for the second half, but it's it's done well that it's it's watchable. It's very watchable. Uh, probably one of his best stories that he's done for Doctor Who, so... You know, considering how many he's done, so I I would recommend watching this one. Um, of course, the callback to the Paladin series is always fantastic, so mm -hmm. I was very happy to see that. Mm. All right, Thomas. Um, I was. I would say this is one of the better episodes of the season so far. Um, as well as... Like, I forget my thoughts on most of the Mark Gaddis episodes, but I would say that this is one of the... I agree that this is one of the better ones he's done. And I think it mainly shows because apparently uh, his kind of um, thing to get this episode done was just asking to do the episode he'd always wanted to do. So he actually cared <laughs> about this one. And, like, 
any um I, I do wonder how Moffat's influence might have changed certain things around, but yeah. Um overall I was pretty happy with this one. Alright. So yeah, I have to agree. Um, that this is definitely one of Gaddis's better episodes, right up there with The Unquiet Dead, his first attempt. Mm -hmm. It is certainly better than Sleep No More, his attempt before this. Um, better than The Crimson it, Horror. Be better than The Crimson Horror. Better than Sleep No More. Better than Night Terrors. Better than Victory better than of the Robot Comics. Sherwood. Better than Robot of Sherwood. Better than the Idiot's Lantern, and in my opinion, better than the original Cold War. Um, actually, yes. Which, which was actually the high point of uh, Ice Warriors up to that point. So, yeah, this is definitely Gaddis good. The acting is good. The characterization of the characters is really good. Special effects are good. The tunnels are believable. There's not much not to like, except for a few little nitpicky things and kind of how mm -hmm. they go together. Mm. So, and those things do add up to make it a good episode, but not a great episode, in my opinion. All right, we go to scoring. And Tim, you are first. I shall give this episode four and a half. All right, Bill. I think I'm going with a four for this one. Four on the floor from Bill. Matt. I so desperately want to go higher, but I have to agree it's not quite there yet. Just a few more fixes. Four and a half. Point five from Matt. Aaron. I'm going to go ahead and give this a four. Or even from Aaron. Thomas. Oh. Um. <clears throat> I'm teetering between 4 and 4.5. Um, Where would you put it if you could get... Just to be... Well, yeah, like, that's what I, I like. I'm, like, comparing it to uh, other ones that I've scored for this series. Well, where would you put it if you could actually do a smaller number? Really quick. Would it be, like, a 4.25? Uh, would it be higher than that? Lower than that? Uh... Uh, you know what? I'll just give it a 4.5. All right. 4 .5. That means that the panel is evenly split between 4 and 4.5, because I said this was a 4.0 episode, and I will stand by that. Giving this a average score of 4.25. This is definitely not a basement dweller. And mm. that puts it in the rankings at... Drum roll, please. Data sort. Sort my data, please. Four point two puts Empress of Mars at number fifty five out of two hundred and three. Top quarter, just about. Mm. Yes, just outside of the top quarter. It is, on, <laughs> it is on the same <laughs> ranking as Frontier in Space, Destiny of the Daleks, Hellbent, Power of Kroll, End of the Line, Death and the Queen, The Mind Robber, Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways, Shockwave, The War Games, Legopolis, Night Visiting, the... You know, the one of the episodes of class, Gridlock. And that's it. 4.25 from us. And that's all we have to say about Empress of Mars. Also, to add really quick, I like the fact that unlike Daleks, they were actually able to talk down the Ice Warriors, which is actually one of the good things about the Ice Warriors. They're not just dumb, blunt monsters in space. Mm. They're thinking too. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, they check are. us out, Bill. All right. So if uh, you enjoy listening to us, please go ahead and uh, like the video. Let us know how you feel. 
put your comments below, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitch so you can uh, be among the first to hear it. You can also uh, like and follow us at facebook.com slash unearthlypodcast and twitter.com slash unearthlypod for news and updates. And if you want to support us, you can head on over to patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast. All right, next week we go from the 19th century past to the 9th century or before way past as we go back to ancient Roman times and their occupation of England with The Eaters of Light, written by Rona Munro and starring Peter Capaldi as the Doctor, Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts, and Matt Lucas as Nardle. See you next week. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.